Good morning. It's good to see everyone out this morning to receive from the Lord's Word and Sacrament. If you have your bulletin announcement sheet, I ask you to please take that out as you are doing. I also ask you to please fill out the blue book at the end of the pew and pass it on down to have others fill it out as well and return it back to its spot. As you can see for today, following the service today, we have a safety, safety committee meeting uh, at 12 o'clock, an LYF meeting. Uh, but we also have the street benefit breakfast going on at the same time. So if you talk to Ellis, he's the head of the safety committee. He'll tell you where you guys are meeting. And then Diane and Amanda, I'm not sure if, not here. So uh, visit with visit with Lyle or Diane or Amanda, uh, or not Amanda, but Diane, to figure out where the youth will be meeting as well for the meeting afterwards too. So keep that in mind. Now, speaking of the benefit breakfast, uh, they, they had a run this morning at 8.30 for uh, the uh, sausage and the eggs and the uh, pancakes and so forth uh, this morning. Uh, they'll, that'll be up and running again at 11.30 as well following the service. So if you have not had lunch, stick around to get some of that food uh, to, to help uh, benefit uh, the street family. Uh, so that will be happening at 11.30 here today as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, look at the rest of the week. We have ladies' Bible study on Tuesday, Wednesday, men's Bible study. And then on Wednesday, it says uh, Lent Vespers, and we're going through the season of Lent uh, right now. And uh, instead of soup and sandwiches, it'll be different this week. My understanding is it'll be some chicken and potatoes and gravy and so forth. Uh, so that'll be instead of soup this week, that'll be going on this Wednesday. As we look to the rest of the week here, there's other uh, information to keep you posted also in the very back of the bulletin. I commend that to you as well. Are there any other announcements that I may have missed or overlooked at this time that need to be mentioned? Well, this morning is the second Sunday in Lent, and we encounter a very familiar passage. We're going to hear about the Gospel of Matthew, about this Canaanite woman who comes, and he comes to, she comes to Jesus, and Jesus responds to her by calling her, get this of all things, he calls her a dog. What on earth is going on with that? We're going to hear more about that in our text this morning and our sermon as well. But before we do so, our opening hymn of invocation is hymn number 760, hymn number 760.
Officer Garnegie, shall I please stand as we turn to the page 150. Page 150. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved you, our neighbors, as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the intro it, printed on the inside of your bulletin, sung to the chanting tune of H. salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help. 
help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday in Lent is from Genesis chapter 32. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jacob. He then he took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Penuel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is in the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to live and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an inventor in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and she knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, Great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. I ask congregation to please be seated as we sing stanza number one of hymn number 588. And we'll ask the children to come forward at this time for 
Lessons for Lambs. See you guys. We heard a really, really interesting story there, didn't we? About a woman, a can her name was a Canaanite woman, and she was crying out to Jesus, crying out to Jesus for help. Now, I want us to think about this here. When it comes to faith, I want us to take our hands. Can we take our hands like this, you guys? This is what faith is. Faith is simply what? Our hands open to receive a gift. Faith receives. I want you guys to say that with me. That faith receives, right? Faith, it what? It receives, right? Yeah, it receives. This woman, she's crying out for Jesus to give help, to give, to give her a gift to help her with her daughter. And that's what faith does. It reaches out to receive the good gifts that God has for us. And that's what makes her faith, what Jesus says, great, is because she, what? Clings to him and him alone. And so throughout the whole service here, when we cry out, we're crying out in our church services every single Sunday. We cry out, Lord Jesus, help us. And he what? He gives good gifts into our hands. So to our hands, what? Faith, what? Receives good gifts from Jesus. Yeah. Let's pray and thank the Lord for this. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us ears to hear, that you give us faith, and that faith receives good gifts from you. May our faith always cling to you, Jesus, receive from you, Jesus, and trust in you, Jesus, today and forevermore. In your name we pray. Amen. We'll dismiss the children with a blessing. Ask the congregation to please turn to the hymn of the day, hymn number 615, hymn number 615.
in the name of Jesus. Amen. My friends, it is really difficult to be insulted. It's really difficult to be insulted when you know the insult is true. Just think about that for a moment. It's also difficult to be insulted when the insult is not as offensive, when the insult is not as offensive as it could be, when the insult could be worse. For example, I can remember riding on an airplane where the passenger next to me found out that I was a pastor and oh my goodness, for the next hour and a half I got to hear all about how just bad, how bad the Christian church was, how bad Christians were, how terrible of people they were. In response to his criticisms, I responded in a peculiar way. I agreed with him. It was quite fun. I agreed with him. In fact, I told him that he was not harsh enough on Christians. I went on to tell him about how Christians were poor, miserable sinners who justly deserve God's temporal and eternal punishment. Needless to say, he was not prepared for my response. He was not prepared for me to agree with him and to affirm him and then add to his criticisms of Christians, especially when I shared that pastors are indeed the worst. You see, we Christians, we should be able to look at our lives realistically. In other words, as you examine your own life, you should examine your thoughts and your words and your deeds according to the Ten Commandments. You should hold up your life, yes, take your life and hold it up in one hand, and then the Ten Commandments in the other hand, and then you compare the two. You compare your life according to the Ten Commandments while saying something such as this, have I been disobedient? Have I been unfaithful? Have I been lazy? Have I been hot-tempered? Have I been rude? Have I been quarrelsome? Have I hurt someone by my words or deeds? Have I stolen? Have I been negligent? Have I wasted anything or done any harm to my neighbor or myself? Then after you have honestly done this, then after you have asked these questions of yourself, you can then say that you are close to reality, close to indeed reality. But what does this have to do with the idea of being insulted? Think of it this way for a moment. If you are ever insulted, chances are the insult is true, or at least partly true. In fact, if you have properly judge yourself according to those Ten Commandments, yes, according to the Ten Commandments, the chance is that the insult is worse, the chance that the insult is worse than the judgment of the Ten Commandments, well, it's not very high. For example, if someone calls you a sinner, well, that is indeed entirely true. However, they could have probably doubled down on the insult. They could have doubled down a little bit more. They should have called you the chief of sinners, for that is closer to reality. You get my point. Again, my friends, the point that is being made is rather clear. When we acknowledge and when we understand reality, when we understand reality about ourselves and the world, when we understand that the world and our sinful nature are every bit as bad as the Bible says, it actually creates a sense of humility in us. Indeed, a sense of humility in you and me. And with this humility, and with this humility, instead of spending all sorts of time trying to justify ourselves, you know, talking ourselves up, well, we don't play these silly games anymore, but we know our place before God. In other words, knowing who we are according to those Ten Commandments, it prevents us from playing those games where we pretend that we're holier than thou. Those games where we pretend that we are on the top of the king of the mountain. Those games where we play, where we put on these metaphoric masks and we portray ourselves to everyone else around us of how good and how smart and how wonderful we are. Ah, the game of charades that we play with life. Instead, instead we can know reality. We can know and understand our sinful condition. We can understand it accurately and realistically. You see, we know that we are sinners, according to the Ten Commandments, and we know that we are in need. We know that we must have forgiveness, that we must have life, that we must have salvation. We know that without grace, yes, we know without grace we are sunk 
that we're done. And so when this happens, when humility sets in, when humility sets in, insults do not matter. Indeed, an insult does not matter when you're at the bottom. Insults do not matter when you've already been humbled to the status of a poor, miserable sinner. The insults of mankind, well, they're small potatoes. They're insignificant annoyances compared to the status of us before God Almighty as poor, miserable sinners. Now, why mention this? This is actually the exact same spot, the exact same place that the Canaanite woman was at in our reading from the Gospel of Matthew. In our reading from the Gospel of Matthew, we heard this morning about a Canaanite woman. She dropped to her knees, begging Jesus for help. As is true for most beggars, this woman, she croaked. The actual word itself, it's to croak like a raven. It was a shriek. It was a cry of mercy that could not be tossed aside. You heard it. You perhaps even felt it in your bones as she shrieked like a raven, crying for mercy. And to boot, while well, she was most likely in the dirt with a posture of reverence, with a posture of fear and desperation before Christ. But this is where our reading from the Gospel of Matthew challenges us quite drastically and dramatically. We hear in response to this woman's cry for mercy, this woman's cry for desperation, that shrieking cry to Jesus. We hear Jesus say to the woman, get this, he says this, it's not right to take bread out of children's mouths and throw it to dogs. Listen one more time. It's not right to take bread out of children's mouths and throw it to dogs. Did you hear that? Did you hear what, did you hear what he said? Did Jesus just call her a dog? Yes, he did. He certainly did. He called her a dog. Now, <clears throat> now there's, there's much ink spilled by theologians trying to understand what Jesus just said here. Many theologians, they spend a lot of time trying to soften what Jesus says as if it was not as harsh as it sounded. Now, I'm by no means a linguist or a historian of cultural uh, colloquial terms of the first century. But I do know this. Calling another person a dog, especially, yes, especially another woman a dog, it's not flattering. It's not a flattering move. It's not something you say to your spouse or your daughter or another woman. Martin Luther even commented on this, saying this, that with all the encounters that we read in the Bible, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, out of all the encounters, none of the encounters were as harsh as this one. And that includes his encounters with Pharisees. But nonetheless, let us not get too hung up on the apparent insult. In other words, we have to caution ourselves from getting too worked up about Jesus calling her a dog. We shouldn't get too offended. We shouldn't get triggered, as they say, or too emotional and unhinged. We don't need to start a petition. We don't need to establish a movement to try and cancel Jesus. We need to just stop. We need to ponder and look at the Canaanite woman. Yes, look at the Canaanite woman. What did she respond to Jesus? How did she respond to Jesus? It's amazing. She doesn't disagree. She isn't insulted. She actually affirms Jesus in his calling of her as a dog. She actually gladly takes the term. She takes the term dog for herself. She says essentially this, You're right, Master Jesus, but beggar dogs do get scraps from the master's table. In other words, if I have to be a dog, I'll be a dog because I want scraps. I'm not sure if you realize this or not, but people who oppose Jesus, people who oppose Jesus always seem to be in front of him. Yes, people who oppose Jesus always seem to be in front of him rather than following him. People who oppose Jesus seem to be standing with pride puffed up rather than kneeling in the dirt with humility. People who oppose Jesus seem to always be arguing with Jesus rather than begging. In other words, and this is really the point for us to ponder today. If you find yourself insulted by God's word, if you find yourself insulted by God's Ten Commandments, if you find yourself offended by the term poor, miserable sinner, well, you certainly are not in the company of this Canaanite woman, but you're in the company of a Pharisee. 
And I remind you, the Pharisees, they killed Jesus. If you are easily insulted in this life, if you are sensitive to the harshness of God's word, his word of law, if his law bothers your conscience, if your law makes you a little bit uncomfortable, want to tone it down, and you're unwilling to be a sinner or to be considered a sinner, well, my friends, it's quite simple. You have to stop taking yourself too seriously. The fact of the matter is this, is that you are not that important. You're not that special. You are not that good. Furthermore, you do not wish, if you do not, if you do not wish to be called a sinner, Jesus then, well, he's no use to you, nor is the church. And the reason being Christ, well, he only comes for sinners. This is why Jesus tells the Canaanite woman that she has great faith. Consider that a moment. He says that she has great faith. You see, great faith knows only two things. Great faith knows that we are great sinners and that we need an even greater Savior. And that is why the Canaanite woman could care less if she was an honored guest at the Lord's table. She could really care less what other people thought of her. It did not matter. It did not matter the insults. It did not matter what people were saying. It did not matter. None of it mattered. It did not matter if she was an honored guest. It did not matter if she was a dog. It even wouldn't matter if she was even an ant under a foot. You see, when a person is spiritually bankrupt, when they are at the end of their rope, they will take about anything, even if it is just a crumb from the master's table. Dear friends, we must learn the meaning of Psalm 84. We must learn the Psalm 84. The psalmist says in Psalm 84, and I paraphrase this, I would rather scrub and mop the floors of God's house than be an honored guest in a palace of sin. One more time. I would rather scrub and mop floors in God's house than be an honored guest in a palace of sin. The point being is this. Beware the trap of taking yourself so seriously. Beware of puffing yourself up too much that you forget or are offended to be looked upon as a sinner. For Christ dwells only with sinners. The gospel is for sinners only. But does this mean that we should go around and pride ourselves in our sins? Puffing ourselves up, look what I can do, look at my sin? Of course not. Celebrating sin is not a reality, it is not it's not reality. It just simply is not. It is not reality, but it's the kind of games that sloppy pigs play. Instead, we confess. We confess that we're sinners. Because it's true. Because it's true. And then, like that Canaanite woman, we sinners direct that cry, direct that confession, direct that acknowledgement of reality, of who we are, to the only one that hears sinners, the only one who loves sinners, the only one who forgives sinners. That's your Christ. Christ Jesus. And as we have heard before, time and time again, your Christ, he does not despise you, he does not despise me, or even the Canaanite woman in the very end. But he forgives, he aids, and he shows compassion. Baptized saints, you are not easily insulted. Each and every one, you are not easily insulted. Insulted, But instead, you confess your sins boldly. That's who you are as a Christian. You confess sins boldly. And then, yes, then, you believe even more boldly. You believe the Christ. For we know, and we have heard, time and time again, that there is more grace in Christ than there is sin in you and me. There's more grace in Christ than there is sin in you and me. And so we confess. We confess reality. And we receive the reality of Christ for us. That is great faith. We are indeed great sinners, but there is an even more greater Savior for you, and His name is Jesus Christ. Where He is, you will also be. In the name of Christ, your Savior. Amen. I ask you to please stand with one heart, one voice. Let us confess our faith as expressed in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the church printed in the inside of your bulletins. Shepherd of Israel, our Lord and Master, remember your tender mercies and loving kindness of old. Do not let our enemies triumph over us, and do not depart from us until you have blessed us. As you strove for Jacob, so strive now for your faithful people who put their trust in you. Lord, in your mercy. Remember the households of this congregation, O Lord. Provide help and companionship to those who live alone. And foster love between husbands and wives, parents and children, that our homes would not be places to worship our bellies, glory and shame, or set our mind on earthly things, but a refuge here and a foretaste of our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy. Remember our nation and those you have placed in authority, O Lord. Give them wisdom and integrity and grant that neither they nor the citizens of our land would hinder your church or despise your call to repentance. Lord, in your mercy. Remember the sick and the afflicted, O Lord. We pray especially this morning for Bill and Brenda, Brittany and Jeremy, Brian, Carl, Charlotte, Connie, David, Don, Dory, Fern, George, Isabella, Jameson, Jared, Brienne, and Baby Hazel, Jeff, Joellen, Callie, Karen, Marilyn, Mark, Maya, Philip, Randy, Robert, Roger, Ruth, Suzanne, Ted, and Travis. Deliver them from the sake, deliver, deliver them for the sake of Christ who cast out demons and performed cures on his way to finish his course at the cross. Strengthen their faith to hold fast to him who rose again to raise them also. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we implore you by your Holy Spirit to strengthen our hearts and confirm our faith and hope in your grace and mercy. Although we have reason to fear for the sake of our conscience, our sin, and our unworthiness, let us nevertheless hold fast like the woman at of Cana to your grace in every trial and temptation. Let us find you a present help and a refuge through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the offering music as a way of reminder of the offering plate is the back of the sanctuary. Offerings can also be mailed in the church office or conducted through the church website online. As to our congregation, please stand for the offertory on 781.
As we continue to the service of the sacrament on page 160, we continue to repent us in faith to receive the gifts the Lord has for us in his body and blood given and shed for us. If you're not a member of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Senate or one of our sister congregations, we do still invite you to please come forward, kneel at the rail, and cross your arms to receive a blessing this morning. And if you'd like to partake of this wonderful gift of the altar, please talk to me after the service about membership here at St. Paul's. We continue on 160. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times, at all places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you've had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks... He gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
ask the congregation to please stand as we sing the Nunc de Menis on page 165. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Maybe see it for departing him. Hymn number 763. Hymn number 763.
it's good to see every one of you out this morning. Uh, just a brief reminder that uh, uh, benefit is still going right now. It's actually starting up at uh, 1130, and so that goes on. So if you haven't had a chance to get a bite to eat, stick around for that. Uh, that will be in the fellowship hall. And as we go, we consider this context here where it comes to insults. We are not easily insulted because we understand our condition as sinners through and through. But that's the glorious news. Christ does as well, and he does something about it. He forgives, he renews, he considers it paid for by his atonement on the cross for you. Go in the radiance and the forgiveness of Jesus for you, and rest in that great faith of the gifts that you receive. Amen.